Okay, thank you. And also, I want to thank um, Sally for organizing this. Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to finally be able to sit down and look at this finished product and have a chance to get together and talk about it. Um, so I, uh, the chapter that I was the convening lead author for was chapter 22 um, on policies. And I'm going to skip through a few of my slides so that I can just focus on, uh, on a couple of things that I want to bring up here. Um, so let's move. So one thing to point out is to remind people that the energy system has had lots of different policy objectives over the years. And so we've talked about access, environmental impacts and risks, security, but uh, I'm sure that many of you are old enough to remember that we were all focused on market power 15 and 20 years ago about uh, reforming the electricity sector. So that's something that we also um, talk about in our chapter. And also that you know when uh, oil and gas prices went up in the 1970s, we talked about how do you manage uh, the wealth from oil and gas resources or others. And that's also part of something that we looked at. But Clearly, the, the sort of policy directions that we've... Um, oh, good. I thought you were holding that up for me. It said five minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I could swear. Okay, I got my watch here, but I don't know if it's trustworthy. Um, so access and environment. Those are the things I'm going to slip through quickly. Uh, that we talk about material development, the technologies, the infrastructure, and human development, capacity building. And all of the chapters include things on policy, so I want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, but in ours, what we tried to do is, ours was kind of the overview chapter for the policy cluster, and so we also put together policy portfolios that match up to what was shown yesterday in terms of uh, the big scenarios that we looked at, the high efficiency scenario, the supply side scenario. And then the, in our cluster, there are specific chapters on access, innovation, uh, and capacity development. And of course, Arnold's gonna follow me on the innovation side. This access environment challenge. Here's a slide that I've been using in talks that comes from the Global Energy Assessment, so I really appreciate whoever put this together. Uh, but, you know, when you look at this, so this is energy use, and you can see North America there, and it, it's broken down all into the final end use sectors. Uh, and, and of course, uh, what we talk a lot about is that we have to reduce energy use and transform to zero carbon pollution. And then on the access side, though, if you look, we've got uh, one of the steps out there is South Asia, and to the left of it is, uh, is China. And, uh, and then further over is Africa. And, um, you know, here's the path that China's been following for the last while. It's been climbing, you still see on a per capita basis, gigajoules of energy per capita, way below and even below a, a global average still. But, um, you know, here's what's gone on in China. And, and what has that meant, though? And I, I think even here we've underplayed or not talked up as much as I think we should this access trade off. It's almost like we want to be in denial a little bit about the access environment trade-off and what it is. And just so I just put up a graph here from China that people are quite familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, part of it's projected, but it just looks at the trajectory of CO2 emissions from, uh, from fuel combustion in China. And um, what I think is interesting is uh, sort of 1987-88, when I was first uh, going to China and interacting with them, I, they seemed to bandy about 200, 250 million people being uh, without access to electricity, and now we would say that it's almost universal, and yet the carbon pollution uh, grew fourfold. And we've been trying to say, well, there are co-benefits and there are other possibilities here to not follow that kind of path. And I think that is a really interesting question. And the, and the, and the reason I think it's interesting is because in about 1988 is when G7 political leaders uh, first committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I sort of think, what, what if at that time they had and I remember going to a meeting in Paris about this and it was, oh, we're gonna put emissions pricing on. And the, the Scandinavians went away and started to do emissions pricing around 91, 92. Imagine if, we, if the, the wealthy countries had done that and used their power of trade or whatever to kind of enforce that globally. 
what would have, and so maybe a rising carbon price, I don't know, starting at $10 in 1990 and climbing in $5 increments or something like that. For me, it's really interesting to think what would have happened in China. So China has, it, its growth rate was, I don't know, its annual GDP growth rate was like 8, 10% per year over this time period. And what would it have been? Um, if it had had that rising carbon price. So to what extent was that cheap coal critical in the economic growth that happened in China? And I mean, I have my own uh, guesstimate of that. We can't run history twice, but I think it's a really interesting thing to think about when we're talking, uh, and, and at least in my view, sometimes avoiding um, some of the critical trade-offs. Now, we, we, uh, we went through a list of policies yesterday for cleaner energy access, so apologies, but I'm just going to skip through these really quickly. Um, there are things that we discussed, uh, uh, even we had a discussion with Hisham yesterday about subsidies and whether or not they'd be directed to, to fuels and, uh, and, and, and Diana talking about building in energy efficiency um, <clears throat> and then issues about uh, investment. Uh, we haven't talked as much about that, but I'm going to skip through this, um, and at least we've got those, we can go back to them, and talk about policies for CO2 reduction. So I'm going to focus in on climate. <clears throat> um, and, and just quick reminder of the kind of criteria. People have their own lists of criteria, but how do we evaluate uh, policies? And, and, and then categories of policies, I keep it real simple. Some, something kind of voluntary, subsidies of various kinds, uh, standards, prescriptive, detailed, performance-based, uh, and then pricing, taxes, cap and trade. Uh, you can sort of have hybrids in there. I think of a renewable portfolio standard as like a regulation. Uh, all right, um, now the five minutes is there. <laughs> So, um, and I wanted to emphasize this distinction between compulsory and voluntary policies. Uh, and, and the reason I wanted to do that is because I want to make the distinction simply that you're going to have to have those kinds of policies. Uh, these alone aren't going to do it, but that's often what political leaders want to talk about. And when you look at compulsory policies, um, you know, we can talk about standards, we can talk about emissions pricing and different kinds of emissions pricing. I get frustrated sometimes when we know it's so difficult to do climate policy that we get in big fights over each one of these. Instead of saying, if the politician wants the standard, let me figure out as an economist how I can design it in a way that gets close to what uh, a more efficient policy instrument would do. So, um, and, and so basic points that climate policy is inherently difficult. And I think we need to have to really grasp that. We really can't dance around that one either. Uh, fossil fuels, uh, their price will fall if we're actually pushing them out of the market. Uh, vested interest diluting, these are things we all know about. Um, public concern fluctuates, and that's the thing I want to talk about. That political motivations fluctuate, and we've just gone through that. But there's actually been about three cycles like that on climate. Um, and so we have to understand we're working against the odds. And that's where I come up with some suggestions here. Am I? Um, one, uh, you know, avoid the idea of this rational policy model. Like, real world policy making is fragmented and chaotic, and it's going to have to be opportunistic. You've got to jump on those windows. So we might think about this great schema of how government should operate in putting together a package of policies, but that's not the likely real world conditions. Assume that politicians will dance around the compulsory policies, and I've already kind of talked about that. So. What are my suggestions? Um, <clears throat> political acceptability is going to be key. Don't argue that only one type of compulsory policy is valid. Try to make regulations as economic. I already said that. Pay attention to the probability that a, pro that a policy has staying power. So I've got sort of a list of how do you build constituencies who will support of people who will support policies. Or here, even something like a carbon tax that we put in in British Columbia that I'm just going to show you with the last few slides. And we put it in and we made it revenue neutral. And a politician just ran an election who 
who would have liked to have cut that tax, but she couldn't because she wanted to balance the budget at the same time. That was also important for her voters. And then I, I'd be interested in talking about the importance of arm's length institutions that have trust. And I'm thinking of California here, the one jurisdiction in North America still moving ahead. What is the role of the California Air Resources Board and the Energy Commission and so on, and that distance that they have from legislators, they've got a mandate from legislators, and then they've got to go and move with that. So, um, and then global action. I'm going to skip that just so I can just show a couple of slides here at the end of a case study. And so it's from British Columbia and it's a, it's a, uh, a survey that we just did. So three slides, I'll make it. Um, and so we had a carbon tax. Uh, it's, it started at $10, it rises at $5. I had a lot of fun in the process of helping to design that. Revenue neutral, corporate and personal taxes cuts. Um, it was actually slightly revenue negative, and I can talk about why that is. The politicians did not want it to be $1 revenue positive, because they're risk averse, it'll be called a tax increase at the end of the day. So you have to err when you're doing forecasts of the income effects, and the, uh, there's a lot of complications there. Um, then we put in, though, a clean electricity standard. 93% uh, of new capacity to be zero emission. You might say, well, British Columbia, it's all hydropower, but actually we have a lot of coal and natural gas. That was what we were about to build and it led to the cancellation. Um, and it does allow carbon capture and storage. Now, here, I want to just quickly, in the last two, three slides, evaluate these two policies and show you a, a survey we did to do a public acceptance. So you can see the carbon tax is forecasted to the year 2020 to reduce emissions about three megatons. The clean electricity standard, 10 to 16. But look at the average cost between the two of them. Right, so I'm talking the average cost for the carbon tax, not the marginal. Way more expensive for that electricity standard because we're foregoing cheap natural gas. And then we've got our ideas, well, administrative feasibility, carbon tax is easy. Now, so we did a survey, 475 British Columbians aged representative. And we asked, first of all, we gave them a, a blank slate. This is the nice thing about online surveys. They can't go back. And we just said, tell us what the climate policies are. Whoops. Um, and of course, 73% had no idea. So we just said, just blank slate, list them. 26% got one, or one or two. It was mostly one. And it was the carbon tax, of course. Um, Next, they were asked to pick a list from real and fictive policies. So we made up a bunch of policies, and they had to pick three or four. And you can see, what I, want, I just want to show you is if you look at the, so what we're calling the smart respondents are the ones who at least got one right. And then what was it that they got? They got the carbon tax. Nobody knew about the clean electricity standard. Nobody seems to know about it. Uh, it had the biggest effect. So last slide. Um, right, so the, the smart, okay, I already said that. Last slide. Next, we gave information on effectiveness and then asked about support or opposition. Um, and so here, here's what I wanted to point out. Uh, the carbon tax has support, right, 56%, but it also has strong opposition. And I can tell you, for politicians, it could have been 10% strong opposition, and, and that's important to them. Um, whereas the electricity standard had uh, almost nobody opposing it and very strong support. So I can't go further into details. Maybe it'll come up in the questioning. I'm sorry if I went a minute over time. Um, but uh, the, it, what I ended up asking is, is the goal public support for a policy, or is it the absence of public opposition? to a policy. Uh, nobody's copied the British Columbia carbon tax uh, in North America, and yet there are policies um, out there that people will go along with. And I think about that when we did acid rain, um, you know, other kinds of uh, ozone depleting substances. When, when I ask people, they don't know what we did. So when we're always saying, well, we've got to educate people and get public support, um, uh, you know, uh, Fortunately, that isn't the huge constraint uh, necessarily. Thanks very much.